Welcome to God's house for worship today. Uh, before we even uh, begin the service, I just want to take an opportunity, this being uh, the weekend of Veterans Day, just to say a thank you to all of our veterans that are in our congregation. Um, thank you for the, the many sacrifices that you made during uh, your time in the service. Uh, also, a thank you to those who are still active members of the, the armed forces. Thank you for, for everything that you do to, uh, to, to keep us safe and to give us the freedoms that we enjoy today. In our service, uh, we are... Uh, continuing this series, The In-Between Time, right? Christ came once, he accomplished all of that work of salvation that he intended to accomplish, and, and, and we know that he is coming again, but we live in this in-between time. During this time, God has given us work to do, and today we see that we have a, a time of faithful service at hand. And so we'll unpack more of what that means during our service today. If you can locate one of those green connection cards on either end of the pew that you're sitting in, we'd appreciate it if you'd fill one of those out and put that into the offering plate when that comes around a little later on during the service. Other than this, just go ahead and take a moment to, to greet those worshiping with you this morning. We will begin then with our first hymn today, Brothers, Sisters, Let Us Gladly. make our beginning today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. 
Trusting in him, I pray. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. with you. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, so rule and govern our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit that we may always look forward to the end of this present evil age and the day of your righteous judgment. Keep us steadfast in true and living faith and present us at last holy and blameless before you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. In our first scripture lesson today from the Old Testament book of prophecy called Isaiah, we see that Israel was engaged in all of the the outward worship rituals that they were supposed to be engaged in. And yet, that worship was not something which extended into their lives. The Lord points out that they were, in fact, uh, guilty of great injustices, oftentimes against their own fellow Israelites. And yet, God also speaks words of cleansing, cleansing from sin and forgiveness of guilt. We read, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. 
new moons, Sabbaths, and convocations. I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. This is God's word. Continue now uh, by inviting the young children forward for the children's message. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Question for you today. How many of you are there? Oh, sorry, sorry. I, I misemphasized the question. How many of you are there? Just one, right? When somebody says, how many of you are there? The answer is that there's just one, right? God has, has made you. The word we use for that is unique. It means you're one of a kind. God has made you a one-of-a-kind person. You have uh, your, your own skills. You have your own memories. You, you come from different places, different houses. You have different parents, right? There's only one of you in the world. And that makes you unique. Now, sometimes when we look at who we are, and we look at all of the talents that we have, and we look at all the blessings in our lives, Sometimes we're tempted to think that we should use all these things just for ourselves, right? To, to use them selfishly so that we can get whatever we think is going to make us happy, right? But when we know who Jesus is, the story changes quite a bit. Right? Jesus is also unique, right? He's the only son of God. He came to this earth he is unique in the sense that he's the only person who ever walked on this earth who never sinned, who always did what was right in the eyes of his father. He's also unique in that he's the only person who ever died on a cross and suffered our punishment for all of our sins, all of our selfishness, in order to rescue us from those things. Right? Jesus, even though he's God eternal, he came to this earth to serve us giving even his own life for you and me. And so when we see God's love for us in Jesus, it changes how we look at our own lives. Yes, we see that we are forgiven. Yes, we see that God says, I'm holy now because of Jesus. But now as I go out into my life, it means that God intends for me to live as Jesus lived, to live as one who serves, one who serves God by worshiping him, by obeying him, by, by glorifying him with our lives, and also someone who takes all those, those talents, those, those things that we have, those things that make us unique, and we now use those also to serve the people around us so that we can build them up, so that we can make them stronger and help them grow stronger in their faith by, by sharing the news of Jesus with them and sharing God's word with them so that in, in all the ways we can, we are helping them to know their God better so that when Jesus comes again at the end, they will have eternal happiness with him. So let's fold our hands and say a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your unique son to be our one and only savior from sin. Help us now, strengthen us by your spirit so that we now go out into our lives to serve you and serve the people that you have put around us. We pray it in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Thanks for coming on up. You can head back to your seats now. As we continue now looking at the, the gospel lesson from Matthew 25, um, Jesus here tells a, a parable, right? He, he's already uh, made known to his disciples that, that he is going to come again, that, that after his crucifixion and resurrection this, and ascension into heaven, this isn't the end, this isn't the last time their eyes will see him, but he will come again in glory. However, he gives us that work to do. Again, he, he has entrusted us, as we learned in the, the children's message, with many different things that make us unique people. He's entrusted us with those things and expects us to use them well, to use them in faithful service for him and for the people of his kingdom. We read this parable of Jesus from Matthew 25, verses 14 to 30. Out of respect for the words and works of our Savior, I'd invite you to please stand for this gospel. Jesus speaks. And says, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, You entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated as we continue with our next hymn.
grace, mercy, and peace are yours through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, now and always. Amen. Today, uh, I am going to do exactly what all my preaching professors at seminary told me not to do. I'm going to start out, actually, with the, the gospel, the, the good news, and, and the reason why is simple. It's because that's how this section of Romans 12 that we're reading today starts out. In fact, if we just look at the first half verse, this is what we read. God, God speaks through his servant, the Apostle Paul, and says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. And as we see that word, therefore, Paul is really pointing back to the previous 11 chapters of this long epistle, this long letter that he wrote to the Christians in that ancient city of Rome. 11 chapters in which God lays out his divine love story for you and me. A story that they had seen and knew, a story of God's mercy. Right away at the beginning of Romans, Paul not only introduces himself, but introduces the central theme of this letter, a theme that we could sum up in the word righteousness, a state of being right with God. But then for the next couple of chapters, Paul gets into the really bad news that you and I are a far cry from that righteousness of God. That we have given ourselves over to all kinds of idolatries and immoralities, that, that we are lawbreakers in, in so many different ways we can't even begin to count them, that we by nature are sold to sin. But then in chapters 3 and 4, Paul executes this beautiful U-turn and gives us the, the very, very good news. The good news that God sent a Savior to go to a cross and die for that sin. There he bore it all. He suffered for all of it. He paid for all of it with his own blood. And as we look to him with eyes of faith and trusting hearts, it means that we have the forgiveness of each and every sin. It means that all of our guilt has been washed away by his blood. And then as Paul continues into chapters 5 and 6 and 7, he goes on to list all of these other blessings that we now have in our lives through faith in Jesus, that we now have fear, that we have hope instead of, of, of fear, that we have peace instead of despair, that we are now enabled by the Spirit living in us to, to serve God truly rather than to go on serving ourselves and serving sin. That we even have the, the confidence in our struggles against the sinful nature, even when we fall into temptation, that confidence that through Jesus, God still views us as his own holy and dear children. And then in chapter 8, Paul doubles down on all of this comfort stuff, pointing out that whatever forces there are which might stand in opposition to us, whether they're from this earth or whether they be in hell or wherever they are, says that none of them is able to kidnap you by force away from the much greater love of God that he has for you in Jesus. Paul goes on to say that each one of us is like a super conqueror through him who loved us. And then finally, in, in chapters 9, 10, and 11, Paul makes sure that all of his readers know that this love is for them. This grace of God is not something that was just for those of the bloodline of Abraham. The Jews know this is a grace that God extends also to the Gentiles, to those whose ancestry had long been cut off from the family of God through disobedience and unbelief. No, God's mercy is also for them. Therefore, in view of all of this, in view of this mercy, in view of the fact that we were destined and deserving of wrath, and yet Jesus has now given us a kingdom and made us heirs of that kingdom, here's what comes next. As we are waiting to come into that inheritance, as we are waiting in this time between Christ's first coming and looking with expectant eyes toward that second coming, God says we've got work to do. And today we are going to be looking at the fact, as, as we go through the rest of this lesson, 
that God intends for us to see this as a time of faithful service. And we're going to consider both who we serve as well as what that service means as we dig into the rest of this lesson from Romans 12. For right now, I just want to look at the the second half of verse 1. We looked at the first half before. Here's how that finishes. We read, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. That brings us to our, our first key point for today, that faithful service begins with sacrifice, right? Right at the beginning of it all, right at the center of it all is that sacrifice of Christ on our behalves. He gives us life forever and he gives us also life, new life right now. And with that new life, God says that that, that we are meant to offer ourselves as these living sacrifices. It's important to note that a sacrifice is never really something that goes part way, right? When those Old Testament Israelites sacrificed a lamb, they didn't, they didn't kind of do that, right? You don't sort of slaughter a bull and burn it up on the altar, right? Likewise, Christ's sacrifice on our behalf was not some halfway thing, right? Not in his living for us, not in his suffering hell for us, not in his dying for us. And so also, as we are in this in-between time, God does not call us to a halfway sacrifice either, as though we might keep one foot anchored in eternity and the other foot anchored in the cares, pleasures, and loves of this life. And that's really what Paul is driving at in verse 2, when he says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Right? And that word transformed means what? It means to be entirely changed, right? To be changed from one form or substance into an entirely different thing, entirely different appearance, entirely different form, entirely different essence, really. And here we see that the transformation is from one old pattern to a new one. From the pattern of this world to a far better one. And maybe I can use a couple of cookie cutters to help illustrate what we're talking about here. Appreciate this because it took me like 20 minutes to find the right ones yesterday, okay? By nature, every single one of us lives according to a certain pattern. And it's what Paul calls here the pattern of this world. I am cut by this pattern, and this is the pattern by which I, by nature, live my everyday life. What I think, what I say, what I do, how I live, how I make decisions, how I interact with the the people and and the things around me is done according to this pattern. But our hearts... And our minds and our souls are made new again when we come into contact with this mercy of God, when we see his love for us in Christ Jesus, and this transforms us to a new pattern, the pattern of Christ Jesus himself, a pattern which he says is one of service. In Mark 10, verse 45, Jesus says to his disciples, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. There's a question which lies at the heart of all this faithful service stuff, and it's this. It's the question, to whom do I belong? Because when I know the answer to that question, I know who I am then meant to to serve with my life. Really, though, there are two parts to the answer. One which is more obvious to us and one which is a little bit less so. Right? The obvious answer is to say, well, I belong to God. And so I am meant to serve him by worshiping him. And that's the the part of the answer that even Old Testament Israel during the time of Isaiah, who we read from earlier, 
in the service, they understood the first half of that very well, at least on a surface level, right? It's why they engaged in the sacrifices. It's why they, they offered, the, the, they, they burned the incense. It's why they gathered together for these holy days and these, and these big festivals, why they raised their hands together in prayer, and we seem to have a pretty good sense of that as well, I think, right? It's why we gather together for worship, right? It's why we come here on a weekend. It's why sometimes we even uh, enjoy those, those special services throughout the year on holidays and things like that together, Thanksgiving Eve, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, all those Holy Week opportunities that we have. And when we come to, to gather together like this and, and, and worship God, right, we do it. We sing the hymns. We pray the prayers. We pay rapt attention to the sermon. We even make sacrifices of our own hard-earned paychecks by putting a gift into the offering plate when that comes by, right? We know that we belong to God, and so we also understand that we ought to serve him by worshiping him. But that's just one half of the answer. If we ignore the other half of the answer to this question, to whom do I belong, or if I pretend like it's not really all that important, so long as we do that first part really, really, really well, it becomes very easy to slip into the same mindset as Israel was in during Isaiah's time. To hide behind a mask of church rituals and rites and activities. And God has some very strong words for such a halfway sacrifice as this. Words like meaningless, detestable, worthless. In the end, it really ends up just being more of this, more of that pattern of the world dressed up in a religious outfit. To whom do I belong? Yes, I belong to God. Yes, I ought to serve him and, and worship him with my entire heart, soul, and being. But there's another half to this, and that's what we're going to find as we finish our reading here from Romans 12 today. Paul goes on and says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. To whom do I belong? God, yes. Who am I meant to serve? God, yes. But we also see, and this is our, our, our second key point today, that faithful service to God also means faithful service to one another because we belong to one another. That pattern of the world and, and the pattern of Old Testament Israel tends to see myself, what I have, who God has made me, my gifts, my talents, my abilities, my resources, my bank account, whatever it is, to see these as opportunities to serve myself with what I think will satisfy me. In fact, in our uh, sinful pride, we often take things a step further and we'll look at other people around us, their resources, their abilities, as opportunities also to serve myself. But that is not our pattern anymore. You know the mercy of God. You see it on the cross you hear it in the hymns. You feel it in baptism. You taste it and you smell it in the Lord's Supper. This mercy of a God who gave up everything to rescue you. And this transforms us into that pattern, which is, in fact, the image of Christ. 
And in that image, we now look at all these things differently. My skills, my talents, my resources are no longer just opportunities to go around serving myself. No, we see these truly now as opportunities to serve others. Especially, the Bible says, those who belong to our family of believers with what will build them up and with what will satisfy them. And we're talking here about something even more than simply indulging somebody else's preferences to put a smile on their face. We're talking about something more even than, 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 than making sacrifices of our own resources to fill somebody else's temporal needs when they're in a time of trouble. Although it certainly does often include those very things I just mentioned. Don't get me wrong. But what is this faithful service at its heart? It means this, that we use whoever I am, whoever God has made me, whatever he has given me, to imprint that image, the image of Christ and his love on others, to impact them with his love again and again and again and again with our lives as we demonstrate his love by our living sacrifices, by our faithful service, whatever that might look like, according to your individual skills and circumstances, we together strengthen each other, building up our own body in Christian faith, in Christian hope, Christian joy, Christian love, so that we would all together know true satisfaction, not a temporary satisfaction, but an eternal satisfaction. When Christ comes again in glory, you have seen his sacrifice for you, how he served you. Now we offer up our own bodies as living sacrifices in faithful service to God and in faithful service to one another. Amen. We will continue now confessing our Christian faith using these words of the, Apostles Creed, of the Apostles' Creed, which Christians have been confessing together for centuries and centuries. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we collect our offerings of thanksgiving for our uh, Savior and for the work of his gospel here in Appleton, uh, I'd ask again that you please put that green connection card into that plate as it comes past you. Thanks. Before we continue on with the responsive portion of the prayer of the church, we'll offer up a couple special prayers. Um, one for uh, Barb and Phil Schlafer. Barb lost her sister Ginny fairly suddenly about a week and a half ago. Um, so I'll ask that God would be with them and, and, and bring comfort to, to them and to all of Ginny's family. Also a, a prayer for all of our veterans um, and for those who are currently serving in our nation's armed forces. After this, we'll join right away uh, in that prayer of the church together. Lord God, uh, we ask today for your comforting hand on Barb and Phil, as well as for all those saddened by the sudden death of Barb's sister, Ginny, whom you in your wisdom took to her heavenly home. According to your unshakable promises, we, knew, we know that those who sow in tears of grief now will reap shouts of joy at the resurrection of your dear people when Christ comes again. Fill all those who mourn Ginny's loss with this hope that their sorrows would be healed and their tears dried as they wait expectantly for that day. O Lord of angel armies, thank you for the faithful service of our veterans, as well as for all those who are currently serving in the armed forces of our nation. 
By their many sacrifices over the years, we are enabled to sleep in peace at night and enjoy the many freedoms we have in this country. For those who continue suffering from traumas incurred during their time of service, we ask for peace and healing. For those who may have lost dear friends during those times, we ask for comfort. May our hearts always be grateful for their willingness to put lives, families, and careers on hold out of love for this country and help us to honor their service by faithfully fulfilling our own vocations as citizens and as Christians. Loving God and Lord, you created the universe that surrounds us and the globe on which we live. You control all things through your Son, who sits at your right hand in glory. Comfort us with the promise of your eternal presence. Give your word power as it works in our hearts and minds. Clear away our confusion and demolish our doubts. Send your spirit to strengthen both our confidence in your promises and our desire to live according to your will. Take away our love of sinning and restore us each day by your grace. The signs of the times warn us that the end of time is near. Protect us from scoffers who sneer at your truth. Spare us and Christians around the world from all forms of hate and persecution. Give us courage to carry the cross with patience and joy. Instill in the hearts of our children a desire to follow you as they prepare for future days. Help them distinguish between what is passing and what is eternal, between instant thrills and lasting joy. Encourage more young people to prepare for service in the public ministry of the gospel. Mold us and move us to be good examples for our youth. Hold in your care, Lord, those who are experiencing physical or emotional pain and all who are afflicted by disease or facing death. Pour out your compassion on the grieving and comfort the mourners who miss someone they loved. Move us to pray for these brothers and sisters and to help when we can. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Whether we pray together or alone, you have promised to hear and answer us. Give us patience to accept your blessings in whatever way you send them. In your wisdom and love, Prepare us for the day when you will take us to be with you forever. Hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. We'll sing our closing hymn.